When we discussed the quality department, we said that one of its responsibilities is often, but not always, safety. However, whether in the quality department or elsewhere, in every organisation there needs to be an identifying process to implement safety in all its activities, including any products it makes. Implementing safety often uses similar techniques to reliability and maintenance, but in this case we're not aiming at keeping the product working, its objective is to make sure our product does not harm things. Having a concern for safety when dealing with a military aircraft armed to its painted teeth with bombs, missiles, guns, it's sort of obvious, as we can see here with all the red warning flags when it's on the ground. However, it's very important to realise that anything can be dangerous. These figures are a little out of date, but it's the same basic story year on year and around the world. Things that you cannot imagine could, in any circumstances, be capable of hurting anyone, in actuality cause tens to hundreds of thousands of casualties in one country every year. Even knowing the figures, I still have trouble envisaging how you can hospitalise yourself with many of these items. Coins I can understand, but folding money, I cannot even think of a way to seriously injure myself with a dollar bill even if I intentionally made it a major project. The message here is that anything can be dangerous, and dangerous in a way you probably cannot imagine. It makes safety a very difficult thing to achieve. Given where safety is handled in many companies, and their use of similar analysis techniques, it's often a tendency to think of safety as essentially an aspect of reliability. We have a mental image of our system doing what it should. So in these circumstances, how can it pose a danger? But it's important to understand that reliability is not the same as safety. A reliable system can still pose a serious threat. Consider, most road accidents involve cars that are working perfectly. But then again, an unreliable system can pose a very low safety threat. Few would consider an unreliable mobile phone a serious health risk in normal circumstances. So if safety is not reliability, what is it? Well, here is Keith Wright, a very experienced safety engineer in the space industry, with some thoughts on what safety engineering is. Safety engineering is protection of the system and life. That's basically its objective. It's got both moral and commercial dimensions. Protection of human life, the environment and other people's property as the moral sign, protection of the organization's investment and its operational capability is the um, commercial side, because if you have a massive disaster, you can wipe out the company or the organization. And the objectives of to, is to obtain the minimum risk, safety risk from the beginning of the project to its final disposal. So you actually start to, you must start working right at the very beginning. Because that's the most cost effective way of doing it. So as Keith said, we can define safety as protection from inadvertent threats while interacting with the product. By inadvertent, we mean things that are due to human mistakes or acts of the gods. In other words, that don't happen because anyone intended them to happen. Although they're not the same thing, reliability can be a factor in safety, but it's not the only factor that needs to be taken into account. Consider a car on the road, which, given that over 25,000 serious injuries and 1,552 deaths occur in the United Kingdom in 2019, is clearly a potentially dangerous situation. There are many threats that can cause safety concerns that are both internal to the system and due to the external environment. And of these many factors that impact safety, only function failure is a question of reliability. All the other threats are independent of whether the car is working properly or not. But before we have an in-depth look at safety, we should also consider the related concept of security. It is also about protection, but in this case, protection from deliberate risk.
that is deliberate as in somebody taking action with the intent to harm people. When there are security requirements, they often conflict with safety. For example, security often drives for the minimum of access points to areas where people congregate. And these access doors are often under tight control with locks, turnstiles, security personnel. Whereas safety will drive for the maximum number of exits, which are easy to use should evacuation be required. And this can lead to compromises like special emergency exits, which only work from the inside. Now this video is only about safety, but given the prominence often given to security, it's important that you understand the difference and that the conflict issues that can arise. This may be a little easier to grasp in English where we have two separate words, but more difficult in French where security means both safety and security. However, in both safety and security, the first question is, what are the things we are trying to protect? This is determined by the safety policy. We start with people. Protecting humans will always be a preeminently important system requirement because of the ethical and legal considerations of the value of human life. In most cases, this is completely blank cover for all people in all situations, but there can be nuances. A distinction may be drawn between the level of safety required for the people who have a proactive volunteer involvement with the system, such as operators or passengers, and third parties who are just involuntarily involved with the system and its consequences. In these cases, a higher level of safety may be required for bystanders. System safety policy can also contain requirements for the protection of animals and increasingly the protection of the environment generally. A third subject of a safety policy could be property, particularly third party property. And finally, sometimes, but not always, the safety policy may cover the system itself. An example from fiction are the three laws of robotics invented by the science fiction author Isaac Asimov in 1940s. And it was used as a plot point for a series of famous science fiction stories thereafter. What we have here is essentially a safety policy that Asimov assumed built into the robots who had the intelligence to enact them as they operated. But back in the real world, we actually have to incorporate, hardwire if you will, the safety policy into the design and operations ourselves. The next question is who decides the safety policy? The obvious starting point would be the customers and operators who use the system in everyday life and they take primary responsibility for what the system does and any consequences of that. But as we will see the players who make the system will also also have responsibilities because the understanding of the system is assumed to lie with them. They are the Frankenstein who created the monster. However, History has shown that when commercial interests are involved, neither the customers or the system manufacturers can be trusted to produce safety policies that the rest of society as a whole will accept as reasonable. Therefore, society as a whole creates legislation that forces aspects of safety policy onto the system stakeholders and players. And this is often the fundamental starting point for the company and product safety policies. Safety policy does not only decide what is going to be protected. It also decides how much protection is going to be incorporated. Safety can never be infinitely good. So in the end, the degree to which safety is implemented is influenced by factors such as ethics. That is what the conscience of the policy creators think they should have often a reflection of what is judged reasonable within society's moral framework. For example, during the Second World War, there was a staggeringly high loss of test pilots. But everyone, including the test pilots themselves, accepted this because of the lives saved in operational service. And the legacy of this view carried on into the 1960s, which you can see if you ever watch the film The Right Stuff. The point here is that different circumstances will lead to different judgments on what is needed.
The next consideration is the cost, and because every loss has a cost, and by that I do literally mean monetary cost. If the policy creators are legally responsible for any deaths and injuries, there will be legal compensation to pay. And so to avoid that legal liability and the consideration of potential legal costs can factor in to what safety efforts are going to be made, maybe even above the ethical considerations. When considering the degree to which property, including the product itself, is protected, this is pretty much dominated by the cost of the loss. And finally, there is publicity that major loss events create and the impact that publicity may have on marketing and public support for both the players and the stakeholders. So what's the difference between reliability and safety in reality? Well, I think part of the answer is that reliability comes from the customer and it's something that you can argue with the customer as to whether he wants to pay for extra reliability or what. Yep. Safety doesn't come from the customer, it comes from everywhere. It comes from outside. When we have safety factors, they are set by standard institutions. When we have uh, safety aspects of aircraft, for instance, mm -hmm. they come from the CAA. And that's important because safety involves people who are not the customer. Yeah. Uh, and this is what should be captured in the safety policy. Yes. The safety policy is not something that the you know, the Boeing or Airbus cook up by themselves. Uh, they're mandated by wider society. That's right. And because they come from outside, they are, I was going to say mandatory, all the requirements are mandatory, but they are mandatory in a sense that you've got to argue with the whole world to get rid of them. Yes, yeah, yes. Um, so, uh, also they can be a bit more specific. I mean, Asimov's laws of robotics are very general. Mm. Uh, they actually require an artificial intelligence to yeah. interpret them as they go along. And I, I think that's actually one of the, uh, the issues. Um, you might think that safety is, let's not do any harm to anybody. Mm. Um, but in fact, safety is in the form of things that are meetable. Yep. If I require, as a CAA for instance, that a failure in an aircraft should be mm. such that we have fail safe, fail safe, mm. um, and then that's something you can actually meet. You can actually put a user there and say that I've done that. Mm. Um, it's it's uh, if I say the safety factor is two point five on this particular mm. piece of, it's two point five. Yep. It's it's something you've met, and it may be that. The th that under some circumstances it might ought to be 2.6. Mm. That's not there because the rule says it's 2.5. Yes, so it, it, it's, you can never achieve perfect safety. Yes. As, as I think Asimov's stories yes. subsequently That's right. proved. I mean, he yes. invented the rules of robotics and then... It, and, and, and then again and again in the story you show that it doesn't work, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Returning to safety policy, the policy must be based on an assessment of what the risk actually is in the real world. And this assessment comes from a risk analysis. The first point to make clear is that a risk analysis is not the same as a hazard analysis, which we will be getting on to later in the lecture. A risk analysis is basically a decision on whether it is worth taking a risk. We've seen before that risk is a combination of the probability of an event and its likely consequences. Now the first factor is the objectual factive assessment of the risk which is the probability of the event or as precisely as we can determine it to be. It could be the result of a numerical analysis following a similar process to the one we saw for reliability analysis or it could be from historical data from past systems, or even a wild guess, but that last one might be difficult to justify if something does go wrong and you have to explain it in court. From the evaluation of what the risk is, we come to the ethical consideration of is accepting the risk worth it or should there be an investment to reduce it? 
This normally involves placing a judgment on the value of a human life. Now, we must be very clear here. This is never saying that a human being is worth a particular sum of money. Rather, it's a judgment on what is reasonable to invest to save, to save a statistical life. A typical value is in the low millions, around $2 million. It can be seen in two ways. Uh, it corresponds to both roughly the average earning potential over a working life, but also it is a sum which, if safely invested, can create a reasonable Western world income. Now, this sort of analysis can come up with such conclusions as it's worth spending a million pounds, but not more, on central barriers on a stretch of road, if statistically they save one life. In the UK, the actual figure that would be invested for this particular application varies with time, but is defined in something called the Green Book, which describes the criteria that the Treasury used to assess public spending. They ask for an evaluation of the statistical life years that will be saved by the safety investment. And as of 2020, place a monetary value of £60,000 on each year saved. In aerospace, the risk analysis normally concludes that an investment in safety should be very high. Now, in civil aviation, the losses of, for example, a full intercontinental flight is the best, the monetary cost is the best part of a billion dollars and hundreds of people's lives may be lost. And the publicity and knock-on consequences can pose an existential threat to an airline or a manufacturer. As a consequence, there are extraordinary efforts in civil aviation to maximise safety. In military aviation, losses typically have a much lower cost, less than $100 million. And the loss of life is also much lower, often just the pilot. And further, the publicity is normally less damaging. People accept that military losses will occur. However, the probability of the risk is much higher what with all that shooting and such like. So they tend to have more safety related features such as ejector seats. In current spaceflight, the money and life losses are comparable to military aviation, but any event is going to have very high publicity and political consequences. So you find the inclusion of escape systems and other approaches to safety are similar to or even beyond military aviation practice. The underlying conception of risk is the same as with the risk register and it's a combination of the likelihood of an event and the consequences of that event. So what role does the risk register, which controls the risks to the development success, play in safety analysis? I asked Keith Wright about this. The risk register um, it's a very valuable tool but it's really a program management tool to look at where you need to do testing, what you need to do to get the program through to the end to a successful conclusion. So that is pretty much none. So do not confuse the two. In theory, not meeting the requirement specification can lend you in court, but actually that's quite rare. By contrast, with safety incidents and their problems that they create, everyone involved can quite often end up in court. If the problem is the way that the system is operated, then the operator is likely to be the one liable. But if the issue is related to the design of the system, then the most common person sued when injury or death is caused by a product is the manufacturer, which happens rather more often than you might imagine, as it is argued that a system should not be able to be operated in an unsafe way. To avoid liability, a manufacturer must be able to show that their product was safe in its design as qualified and that it was built without any dangerous defects. As we shall see, that's a form process which is normally conducted in parallel with the verification process. But the producer must additionally show that the product is not dangerous when used in a way that the producer did not intend, but which it was reasonable to expect users to do. And of course, to demonstrate that they've complied with all their statutory duties. The tricky thing here is trying to guess 
all the ways in which stupid people or ingenious people uh, might dangerously abuse your product uh, before they do and take you to court. Yeah, there's a, a story here, um, which I, I don't think is apocryphal, I think it's real, which is um, in the early days of microwave ovens, sort of we're talking about 1980s, uh, some Manhattan socialite took her dog for a walk in the rain and when she got back a little sort of laptop thing she put it in the microwave oven to dry it out and not surprisingly killed the poor little doggy. She then sued the microwave oven manufacturer for not informing her that the microwave was dangerous to dogs and she won. Um, which is why you see of often these safety booklets, the first thing in a booklet is a load of pretty obvious things. Yes. You say, well, why have they done that? They've done that for the little old lady who puts their yes. dog in the microwave oven. Yes. Because, in America at least, <clears throat> you're reliable for have not you know, thought people would use yes. it that way. And we have lots of examples of, of people thinking about the problem and coming up with the wrong answer. answer. Yeah, and then fixated on their wrong yeah, answer. That's right. Yes. <sighs> As this is life. I had an example uh, when I was working down in Bristol uh, of uh, a hydraulic line mm -hmm. with a non-return valve in it. Yep. And carefully to avoid any possible uh, things, you have a big arrow on the outside and you have yep. different screw threads at either end of it yep. so that it can only, and it can can only, only go in one way. Oh, yeah. And we discovered one of these had been mounted the wrong way around with an adapter applied to <laughs> put it because somebody had worked it all out in his head and got it wrong. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, there's always a fool bigger than the these. proof. Yes, as I say, there's always a fool bigger than the proof. There are two basic routes to generating safety rules, procedures and guidelines that can then be implemented into the product. One route is to produce rules from the results of lessons learned from past accidents and other safety failures. And this is broadly the approach used in aviation. The manufacturer proves these points before delivery, which in civil aviation is a process generically known as airworthiness. With space systems, the legal position is slightly different, but more importantly, there is significantly less experience compared to aviation, so they adopt the second approach, which is to implement safety through a top-down analysis approach. Before looking at that, let us look in more detail at the aviation approach and airworthiness. As we said, the manufacturer is often the main target when issues of safety liability arise, and in civil, civil aviation, this is reinforced by the Warsaw Convention and the Montreal Protocols, both of which increase the liability of the manufacturer. But if the manufacturer can prove the aircraft as designed and supplied was airworthy, then the liability focus turns to the operator. The first point to make about airworthiness is that it is solely about safety and has nothing to do with meeting the aircraft's technical requirements. Safety processes, like airworthiness, are something completely different from verification, even if they are conducted in parallel. The key to being able to legally demonstrate airworthiness is that the manufacturer or operator must have satisfied an independent legal authority that they have met requirements and then they get a certificate of airworthiness. Now, the certificate of airworthiness generally can be used as a legal defence that what is expected as a reasonable effort to ensure safety has in fact been done. So who decides if a system is airworthy and therefore give this magic certificate of airworthiness? In civil aviation, it is the national aviation authorities, which under international law, every nation must have. In the United States, it is the Federal Aviation Authority, the, the FAA. In the United Kingdom, it is the Civil Aviation Authority, the CAA. However, for commercial aviation, it joins with the other European countries and the process is run by the Joint Aviation Authority, the JAA. The American and European authority tend to dominate global aviation as between them they cover Boeing and Airbus. 
These two authorities do make efforts to coordinate with each other to give an overall consistency across the world of, of civil aviation. Now for military aviation, it is the government's defence ministry, such as the Department of Defence in America or the Ministry of Defence in the United Kingdom. Now you can probably see here an immediate issue of a lack of independence. It's got more than a hint of marking your own homework. And in the UK, that led in 2000 to move military airworthiness activity to a semi-independent body called the Military Aviation Authority, which, while still part of the Ministry of Defence, has an independence and has also developed strong liaising links with the Civil Aviation Authority to ensure consistency of aviation safety across the whole country. These authorities set very general airworthiness requirements. But these general requirements then require interpretation on a product by product basis. So early on in the design process, the manufacturer will discuss with the authority the interpretation and the test program to prove safety compliance for their particular aircraft. This can sometimes be a difficult concept to get across. A decade ago, I was part of a team with Reaction Engines, which together with other space plane companies, most of which had space backgrounds, started discussions with the CIA about how we could get space planes certificates of airworthiness. Now, some of the space plane teams were very resistant to getting certification, as they thought it would mean they would have to use specific standards that would be dictated by the CIA. And if it were a US military program, they might have to use the appropriate mill standards. Now, the problem here is that for space planes, sometimes an aircraft standard is not appropriate for a system that has to operate in space. But in actuality, the CAA will have a very vague requirement, like the structure shall have adequate strength, which is rather vague, but it gives the design authority the choice as to how they assess the structure's strength. But then, of course, they then have to prove to the CIA that the way they are doing it will ensure, at the end of the day, the structure will be safe. The aim here is to ensure that intelligent thought is given to the approaches used in a specific design and any unusual features it may have. So how do the aviation authorities derive the starting point airworthiness requirements? Well, because of the long history and the large volume of aviation activity, it means that all the obvious ways for accidents to happen have already happened many times and the lessons learnt and incorporated into industry practice a long time ago. These days, civil aviation accidents are either the results of illegal activity or an unfortunate combination of unusual events that could not reasonably have for, be foreseen but are now then incorporated into future requirements to prevent them happening again. As a consequence, the aviation authorities generate new requirements as a result of lessons learned from past accidents. This is one of the reasons why air accidents are always investigated in so much detail, so the authorities can maximise the lessons that can be learned from them. This is not really a systems engineering method, as it does not view the system as a whole uh, and it's not dealing with a sort of analytic top-down point of view. It's, it's much closer to actually to Darwinian natural selection as a, as a process. One of the best illustrations of this sort of thinking that I found was in a book by David Thurston entitled Design for Safety. His book starts with the statistics of accidents, in particular concentrating on the years 1948 and 1977 and then shows methods uh, to design to minimise the risks with the amount of space in the book devoted to a subject corresponding roughly to the frequency of the problem. Pilot error was and still is the biggest single cause of accidents but it is getting better. In 1948 it was 75% of all accidents and by 1977 it was 58%. So the book works through the statistical causes for these pilot errors and then tries to work out the best way of dealing with them. Uh, in more detail, one of the biggest causes was a failure to maintain flying speed. So the book discusses how to improve stall characteristics of aircraft. Another comparatively common cause is the failure of the pilot to see obstacles. 
so the book considers instrument and cockpit design to improve the way a pilot can concentrate on them. Uh, and so on with fuel supply and power plant, each getting a chapter of their own to discuss ways in which safety could be improved. Because safety is mainly a record of historical um, events yes. and our experience from it. Uh, I remember a paper when I was working in explosives uh, that started, all explosive safety legislation starts with a big bang. Yes, and this is why aviation works the way it does, because it's over 90 years of commercial aviation, passengers have been flying, whereas almost a billion passengers a year fly, and aircraft as a result have ended up being very reliable and safe because of that history. Um, which is why aviation tends not to rely too much on top-down analysis, they still do it of course, but they're not relying on it, they're relying on the, the rules and regulations that have been built up over time. Um, the problem with top-down analysis, I, I, it, it's not quite safety or reliability, but it's using the same technique. In, in the 70s, before the shuttle became operational, uh, NASA spent $10 million, and this is in the 1970s when you could actually buy something for $10 million, um, looking at and preparing themselves for all the maintenance activities that they would need to do when the shuttle came in. The shuttle would come in mm. uh, and they would already have a maintenance procedure sorted out because they spent 10 million working out all the procedures. In fact, that exercise only caught a third of the things that they actually had to deal mm. with when they got into the real operation. So all these attempts of human beings to try and think it through without the history are always going to fail to and probably fail more than you realize at the end of the day. Um, now the problem of course with space is we don't have the history. So although you've seen with your tally curves and things we're beginning to pick up history and reliability and, and therefore also safety. Uh, I nearly mix safety and reliability there. Both <laughs> things both things actually improve yes. uh, with with history. We don't have enough of it for it to really have the same impact that it has on aircraft or cars or things yes. that we use in everyday life. We have mentioned hazards a few times, and this is a key concept in safety analysis. Safety situations start with hazards. That is, things that create a risk of harmful consequences. It should be remembered the systems do not necessarily fail because one component breaks or hazards occur because of component failure. Instead, systems contain hazards which only become major problems when a chain of circumstances occur. The underlying goal of top-down analysis is to attempt to identify all the hazards and then find ways to prevent or control and, if necessary, escape from those hazards. There are many variations on this basic approach but let us look at a couple of examples. NASA has a methodology which integrates the stages of the hazard analysis into the system life cycle. The steps being matches to the understanding of the system as it evolves. The weakness we have already discussed, identifying all the hazards and all their present potential causes, is a big ask and almost impossible to achieve in practice. It may seem obvious, but the safety methodology should be started in the early stages in that it's much easier to implement safety into design from the start than to try to add it to an inherently unsafe design later. This point is made in this chart in a paper by Keith Wright. In the concept and design definition phases, small investments can have a large impact on safety, whereas once in operation, even large investments may have only a limited impact on a poorly designed, inherently unsafe system. To try to get some structure into the hazard analysis process, the European Space Agency uses the scenario sen sentence shown here. This outlines the chain of events that leads to undesirable consequences, and then controlling or eliminating the problem by interrupting that chain at one or more points by corrective action. The hazard analysis then attempts to identify all the aspects in capitals in every hazardous scenario. Once again, the weakness lies in assuring that all the hazards have been captured. 
Here we have a more complex hazard chain uh, with the various ways in which the consequences could be reduced either by eliminating the hazards or, if this is not possible, by minimising or controlling them and perhaps in the final extreme providing a means of escape or rescue. Hazard analysis attempt aims to identify each of the aspects in the hazard chain illustrated for every hazardous scenario and then to identify and implement controls on the causes. For any reasonably complex system this could be an extensive process and should not be undertaken all in one go. The form of a hazard analysis is similar to a Formica using a similar logic but the starting point is hazards rather than failures. It then works through the logical consequences and records the actions taken to retire the risk. The example here is from the hotel project in the 1980s, hence the handwritten form. This hazard analysis of electrical ground support equipment, EGSE. Uh, a couple of points to note. Firstly, the detail that the system was being examined for safety, even though this was the concept stage. Secondly, if you look at the column headings, they follow the ESA scenario statement as the project was using the ESA approach. Another column is labelled category. Hazards are normally categorised in some way. This enables the hazards to be prioritised and helps to determine the action to be taken. The following is an example from the space industry, which uses three categories. Typically, rules that might apply during system design hazard analysis is that no two system failures should lead to a catastrophic hazard. That is, three things must go wrong for life to be at risk. Another rule might be that no single cave failure should lead to a contingency situation. A contingency situation is one where two or more failures leads to a catastrophic hazard. This would then require a departure from nominal activity to correct the situation. The three things must go wrong for life to be at risk requirement was supposedly used on the space shuttle, but the solid rocket boosters did not actually meet this requirement. Although there were two seals in the failure chain that led to the Challenger accident, they had a common cause failure, that is, the condition that causes one event increases the risk of the second event. In this case, if one seal failed, it almost certainly meant the second field was also at serious risk. Given the similarity of the underlying approach to hazard analysis and Formica's, I asked Keith Wright for his view on these two methodologies. Right, for Mika, failure modes, effect and criticality analysis. It describes exactly what it does. It evaluates the design for the effects of failures which occur. And you obviously need a, a, a good understanding of the design. You evaluate where all the possible failures are and what their effects are. And out of that, you should get a critical items list where you're uh, identifying mainly single point failures and then you can manage those critical items either by uh, looking at how risky they really are or by just eliminating them by putting redundancy in or safety or I say safety backup features yeah but a uh, hazard analysis uses a very similar sort of overall technique but is very different Yes, yes. Instead of starting with failures, you, you start by identifying the hazards that are in the design and in the operational environment of the system and induced by the operation of the system. Hazards being things that can cause threats or can cause damage. damage. So well, what you do is you, you identify those where they are in the design, look at how they can propagate, what the, what the result of that propagation is, how severe it is, uh, you identify, to do that, you need to identify the possible causes of that propagation. And it's not just failures. You're looking at uh, operational incompatibilities, things we call sneaks or sneak circuits, where you have a, an unintended operational mode, something you never designed in, um, 
inadequate design margin. So you're looking at the design quality as well. Materials inadequacies, materials incompatibilities, environmental effects, procedural inadequacies as well. Uh, so it's, it's, and there's something else which I don't think Famica looks at, and that's common cause and common mode failures. Common cause failure, classical Apollo 13, where you lose your redundancy because uh, you uh, propagate the failure to the redundancy. And common mode is where you have something which fails. You have redundant equipment. It may wear all, all wear out at the same time, for example, a common mode there. So you, you, you need to consider those. And uh, we basically, in uh, at ESA, when I worked at ESA, we considered those were single point failures. So we had to try and design them out if we could. Well, for one of them was, um, we were looking at our, uh, it was in the life support system in Space Lab. <clears throat> and we had a centrifugal condensate separator where we were pulling the condensate out and moisture out of the air. And we mounted them at right angles to each other because Space Lab was launched repeatedly up and down, up and down, and you were getting vibration and acceleration. And if you turn them at 90, you've got different wear modes in, in, in the mechanisms. So what do we actually do, particularly in the design stages, to incorporate safety? Let's return to the safety chain. We see that there are several actions here that we can take to break the safety chain. These can be summarised as three broad classes of action, which in order of priority are prevention, which if that fails, then control, and then if that fails, then escape. Now, obviously, the first and most desirable approach to achieving safety is not to have hazardous situations develop in the first instance. So the first line of defence is to minimise the system's ability to create hazardous situations, in short, prevention. For each component of the system, two questions must be asked corresponding to the two ways a failed component can become a hazard. The first is what happens if the component fails to perform its function. Sometimes this is a safety question, for example, the brakes on a car. And sometimes it isn't. A car radio does not create a hazard because it's not working. It is this aspect of safety that is a question of reliability. The second consideration is, does the failed component represent a secondary hazard? Now, this can range from having an exposed sharp edge containing a couple of kilograms of plutonium. But, for example, a failed car radio may be a fire ignition risk due to shorting, even though its loss is not a functional hazard. Having identified the possible failures, the system can then be designed to either eliminate them or minimise them. With function failures, the only way to improve safety is to improve reliability. With secondary failures, it's practices like using non-flammable materials, rounding sharp corners, leak before burst pressure vessels and such like are the methods that are then used to improve safety. Now, systems can often be dominated by one class of hazard, and the safety practices for different types of system often reflect this. Dynamic systems, such as cars and aeroplanes, tend to emphasise function failures, and this leads to reliability and redundancy as major concerns. Static systems, such as buildings, tend to emphasise secondary failures. This leads to hazard control as being the prime concern. But I should issue a warning here. A common problem when function failures dominate is to forget about secondary hazards. The example is the Apollo 13 incident where redundant oxygen tanks gave adequate reliability to minimise risk due to function failure. The problem was that the tanks were placed side by side so when one tank exploded, which was the most likely failure mode, the second tank and other systems were taken out as well. This concentration on one class of failure can also lead to inappropriate system design practice. 
This table is a summary of a paper I wrote a quarter of a century ago looking at design approaches to launch systems and space stations and the consequence of designing space stations as if they were launch vehicles. We have seen that launch vehicles are highly dynamic and concentrate on function failure quite correctly. So when it comes to making space stations, the same customers and manufacturers treated safety in the same way, concentrating on functional failures. But in reality, space stations are really static systems and almost immune to safety related functional failures. In its later life, the Mir space station sometimes ran out of power during the night portion of its orbit because the batteries were too old and couldn't hold enough power to see it through. So essentially, the whole space station lost all its functionality. But this barely counted as a hazard. Given it lasted a few minutes, the astronauts had some quiet because all the noisy stuff had switched off, and when sunlight returned, the space station returned to its um, operating capability. And any function on a space station could be lost for hours without putting the crew at any risk at all. Whereas history has shown that the real emergencies on space stations have always been due to either an outside event or secondary hazards like fire. So I was arguing that we should treat space stations more like buildings than launch vehicles, which has the double effect of making them both cheaper and safer. If prevention fails, then the next step is normally taking some specific action to control the hazard and eliminate its consequences. For example, if you have a fire, put it out. Control nearly always means adding special hazard control elements into the system. For example, fire extinguishers. Now, if there is a system element whose function is to control a specific hazard, it must have a means to trigger it. That is, there must be a method of detecting the hazard has occurred, which feeds back into the hazard control equipment. For example, make sure you have a fire detector and an alarm, as well as the fire extinguishers. If there is a common mistake with control, it is insufficient concentration on the detection process. The last resort, if prevention and control fails, is escape. That is, get what you are trying to protect away from the hazard. To do this, there needs to be a safe place to go to, and such places are called safe havens. So let's look at some examples. In public buildings, this is normally easy. The safe haven is somewhere outside the building and typically you'll find there's a designated assembly point where an assessment of the situation can be made. On ships it's more difficult as the sea is a dangerous place to be in most circumstances. So larger ships carry their safe havens with them in the form of lifeboats. But with aircraft it's even more difficult as leaving an aircraft while it's in the air is only achievable with the parachute which is only practical in very special circumstances. So normally the priority is to safely land the plane first. And this is why a major part of obtaining an airworthiness certificate for a passenger plane is demonstrating evacuation of the landed aircraft in 90 seconds, making the ground the safe haven. Something like 90% of civil aviation casualties occur after the aircraft has come to a stop on the ground. And that is why this is such an important factor in obtaining an airworthiness certificate. In space, crewed launchers normally have escape systems during the launch. The exception was the space shuttle, which was probably the one that needed it the most. By contrast, long-term facilities like space stations use the capsules that delivered the crew as lifeboats. Now, if you have safe havens, you need to be able to reach them. And this means planned escape routes that work during the emergency conditions, which in turn often means protection provisions for the escape routes. Protection means barriers between what you're protecting, such as a person, and the hazard. Now these can be specific to the hazard, putting some local protection around the likely hazard source. Or more general blocking, such as firewalls or doors or specific to the person, such as gas masks or protective clothing. Another point to be made about escape routes is that two separate routes to the safe haven is nearly always desirable, and in some cases is actually specified. 
many hazards like fire, in fact in particular fire, can cut off one route which with only one route traps the people who are trying to escape, hence the second route to, uh, to get around that problem. So what are the takeaways on safety? We define safety as protection from inadvertent threats while interacting with the product. So we need to start by having a policy defining what it is we are protecting and the level of investment to be made in providing that safety. We can then turn to identify hazards and the means to deal with them. Safety should be implemented into the design, development and operation through formal methodologies like certification and hazard analysis. Like the verification process, it should be an activity that is integrated into the life cycle from the start, although remember it is a separate activity from verification. At the start of the project, leading up to the system requirement review, we should identify hazards and their causes. At the preliminary design review, the methods of controlling the causes should be identified. Finally, at the delivery review board, we should verify that those controls are incorporated into the build. While top-down analytic approaches are needed and should be done, always be aware that it has limitations because it suffers from the failures of human imagination. This highlights the importance of an industry learning from the history of incidents to create the guidelines and the legislative frameworks that will implement safety into their products. Implementing safety may not figure highly in the day-to-day -day activities of those involved with the system, unless of course you are the system safety engineer. However, it is important that safety should always be understood by everyone involved and should always be a, con a constant consideration. 